Hello, and welcome to Living With Your Dog. I'm Charlotte Peltz, a Certified Animal Behavior Consultant. I would like you to be able to contact me with any questions you may have regarding particularly behavior issues, but I can address other things as well. One of my favorites is nutrition. So we're here to help you, and Nate will tell you how to get your questions to us. To get your questions to us, just email livingwithyourdog at gmail.com. That's living with your dog at gmail.com and also you can find living with your dog on facebook living with your dog living with your dog living with your dog with charlotte hi welcome to living with your dog i'm charlotte Peltz, certified dog behavior consultant and lucky us we have a really wonderful guest today that miller is going to join us and i asked her to please address the subject of stress in our dogs but first let me tell you who pat is her professional life has always involved animals, uh, first as a horse trainer in Wisconsin, and then for 20 years as a humane officer in the Marine, the Humane uh, Society in California. And actually between those two, she worked with me in the horse business. So that's where we go way back. She launched her own dog training company on the West Coast in 1996, after five years assisting nationally acclaimed obedience instructor, Judy Howard of Ardeth Obedience, and relocated the Peaceable Paws Dog and Puppy Training Center to Chattanooga, Tennessee in the year 2000. Then to its present 80 acre campus in Fairplay, Maryland in April of 2004. Pat received her CPDT-KA certification as a professional dog trainer from the Certification Council for Professional Dog Trainers in September of 2001. One of the first 136 trainers in the world to attain that title and then her CBCC-KA a few years later. She's also a freelance writer and author regularly contributing articles on dog behavior and training to the Whole Dog Journal. Actually, she is the training editor for that magazine and you've heard me mention her before. Her first dog training book, The Power of Positive Dog Training was released by Howell Book House in August, 2001 and has been on amazon.com's best selling dog training book since 2002. I strongly recommend that book. It's, it's, a, it's a classic. Okay, her other books are Positive Perspectives, Positive Perspectives 2, Play With Your Dog, Do Over Dogs, How to Foster Dogs, and Beware of the Dog, Positive Solutions for Canine Aggression. A crossover trainer like I am, Pat started her long dog training career using old-fashioned methods that relied on the use of force-based tools and methods, jerk on the choke chain, harsh verbal corrections, and successfully earned numerous obedience titles, titles with a variety of dogs, including a rough collie, a bull terrier, an Australian Kep Kelpie, a Pomeranian, and Josie, her wonderful terrier mix. It was Josie who convinced her to cross over to force free methods, and she's now fully convinced to science based positive reinforcement training. That shares her fair play home with husband Paul, their dogs, cats, horses, chickens, and a pot belly pig. They also operate Peaceable Paws Pastures, a horse board training facility. And of course, she has her own trainers program going on. So that's our Pat. That's our guest for the day, folks. And I'm thrilled to have you here. Now, Pat, I remember uh, finding it so interesting at some point when I heard you say that so much of aggression is based on fear. And we've had a lot of experience over the years where people will say, oh, it's an aggressive dog, where aggression is a behavior. It's not a title or a declaration of what a dog is any more than it's alpha. And that's what the dog is. But now I'm concerned and interested in stress. Mm -hmm. what, how do we recognize it and tie it together, if you can, for us with, with fear and link what I think is probably for certain is when we are stressed because our dogs are such sentient creatures that stresses them and the reverse happens so you're here you go <laughs> <laughs> okay so that's a bunch of different topics that you tossed out there and we can talk about all of them first i want to say you know listening to you talk about my um biography i realize how incredibly fortunate I've been to be able to spend my whole life doing work that's very meaningful to me and you know how many people um, don't get that so I, I really do appreciate that um, I've, I've managed to 
wrangle my life to to work for me in that way. So yes, stress, important topic in um, how we live and work and train with our dogs. Um, with one very rare exception, aggression is across the board caused by stress. And I'll get that one very rare exception out of the way before we go any further. Um, a behavior that used to be called rage syndrome, very oh. unfortunate <laughs> title, um, is in fact um, what we now call idiopathic aggression. And idiopathic is just a very um, fancy scientific word that means the we don't know what causes it. <laughs> right, right. So if your doctor tells you you have, um, you know, idiopathic pain in your liver, what he's saying is, yep, your liver hurts and we don't know why. Okay. Right. So <clears throat> idiopathic aggression is very, very rare. I've talked to a number of veterinary behaviors friends of mine and – you know, they may have seen one in their career, and true idiopathic aggression, um, there's really nothing we can do about it. it. It it really is something horribly wrong in the brain that can't be fixed. And so if 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 idiopathic aggression is is actually present, the answer is euthanasia. Yeah. Short of that, and it's very rare, very rare, um, way overdiagnosed. What people used to say was rage, rage syndrome often wasn't. It was also called Cocker Rage and Springer Rage. Right, I remember that. And I even <laughs> even to this day, I have clients who come to me and, and say, I think my dog has rage syndrome. When I do this, he bites me. Uh -huh. Well, <laughs> if you can say, when I do this, he bites, then it's not idiopathic. Then we know what's triggering it, okay? So um, you're absolutely right that aggression is a behavior. And so I don't talk about aggressive dogs. I talk about dogs with aggressive behaviors. And the vast majority of my clients that I see, and I do have a, um, a fairly heavy lean toward aggression cases in my behavior practice, um, the vast majority of those dogs are wonderful most of the time. And that's why their cli the clients, their owners, are working so hard to help them through whatever this particular challenge is. Um, so, yes, it's, it's dogs with aggressive behaviors or dogs with an aggressive behavior, not an aggressive dog. It's not the whole dog. So um, one of the things that we look at with ho this whole idea of stress, you're, you're absolutely right that fear is the most common presentation of aggression. And, um, you know, other I've talked to other behavior professionals who agree with me on that, veterinary behaviorists who agree with me on that, that by far fear is the most common presentation of aggression. And it's not always perceived as fear because a fearful dog can learn that the best defense is a good offense, that the way to keep scary things away from them is to, is to look, is to become aggressive um, even before someone thinks a fearful dog should. We think of the fearful dog as the one, oh, if you trap him, trap him in a corner or something, yeah, he's going to bite to protect himself. But fearful dogs can learn fairly early on that a growl, a bark, a snap, a lunge can make the scary thing go away. And so I often see in my practice dogs who for whom the aggression really starts presenting between the age maybe of eight months, sometimes a little bit earlier, to a year to a year and a half, and um, whose owners were perhaps unaware of how stressed, how fearful their dogs were. Um, often when I'm talking to them in a consult, I will say, you know, was he, you know, how, how was he as a puppy? And I often get the answer, oh, he was fine. And now I always put fine in air quotes because mm. um, it, it's way, one, way overused, and two, um, it doesn't describe behavior. And most of the time when people think that their um, dog who now is exhibiting aggressive behavior was previously fine, just weren't aware of the signs and the signals that their dog was giving them um, that was leading them 
more and more toward using aggression as their way to, in their mind, survive. So um, it's often, well, yeah, he was a little shy as a puppy, but he was fine until this happened. And a fearful puppy is likely to shut down, right? And our human response when we see a puppy who's a little bit scared is, oh, poor baby, and we want to run over and pick him up and cuddle him. And he shuts down, and his little puppy brain is going, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Oh, no, I'm going to die. And somewhere along the line, um, he maybe gets up the courage when, when this is happening to do a little growl. And the person backs off because a smart person backs away when a dog growls. And his brain goes, oh, that worked. I'm going to do that again. So the behavior of growling was reinforced, and behaviors that are reinforced increase. So the next time maybe he growls sooner or louder or growls and snaps, he's learning a behavior strategy that's keeping him safe from the things that are scary to him. So in adolescence is when we usually see um, more, more significant aggressive behavior emerge because now the dog's had um, some chance to practice it, and has realized that this is a successful beha- a successful survival strategy for him. That um, I I can feel so heartbroken and sincerely aware of what you're saying because Angie, my standard schnauzer that I adopted six years ago, is precisely what she's an example of precisely what you're talking about. She spent the first eight months of her life in a kennel at Skansen Kennel, at Skansen Breeders. And Mm -hmm. I'll bet you that she would, she learned to growl at the guys that were cleaning the kennel and they'd go away. Mm -hmm. And and so she's she's a fear biter. Uh, Mm -hmm. For example, when I recently had a reason to take her to the vet and I handed the the leash over to the vet tech, she's a perfect angel. She gives Mm -hmm. them no problem whatsoever. As soon as they brought her back to me and the guy walked away, she was bark, 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 barking at him. Uh-huh. And when, when I've met people that, and she's better, she's better by a long shot, but you know, there's, I can't say, we can't set the clock back, but it's don't turn your back on her. She, she will growl if you attempt to pet her. She didn't to the vet tech. She's got a, a real serious respect for authority like the vet and, the, and a groomer. When I first got her, I do the grooming myself now. But it's very interesting to see. I'm sh- I know it's fear. I know it is. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. she's so fitting the picture you're talking about. It gives me an opportunity to say, you know, I have that dog right here at my mm-hmm. side. Mm-hmm. And, and it's and- also classic what you describe um, for the fearful dog to snap or bite as the person walks away. Right, yes. When they're not brave or confident enough to make that statement when, they're, when the person is facing them. Right. But it's, it's like when they turn to walk away, then the message is, and I said, stay away. Right, <laughs> <You know? clears throat> right. And, um, and so of course that, is, that is really classic fear-related um, right. aggressive behavior. And yeah. it's also an enormous yeah. statement and what happens or what may happen when dogs are not socialized properly. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to, I wanted to put that in there that you know, the audience can understand that these dogs do exist. It's not just a trainer and a, and a behavior consultant and a person <laughs> with your experience talking about it. This is a reality. This is something right. that- and- Absolutely. And one of the things you're saying a lot on media now is the concern about all the puppies that were acquired during the shutdown oh, yeah. that that probably have not received um, a normal amount or, or an appropriate amount of socialization because everybody was you know, staying home, as right. rightly so, uh, but yeah. it still can make life difficult for those. Puppies. Oh, I think so. Uh, the other thing, of Going course, forward. is not just the socialization and all of its levels, but the other element that is surfacing is what's going to happen to these dogs when you've been there 24-7 and now you're leaving right? and, and getting on with things. But let's get you back right. on track because we've got a lot of things here for you to tell us about. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, 
So um, when we're talking about stress, um, a couple of really important things to, to know that when we talk about stress as it relates to aggression, there's a phenomenon that, we, um, that occurs that we call trigger stacking, which means it's not just the stress of the immediate trigger, of the obvious, oh, my dog doesn't like men, so that's a stressor for her. But um, stressors stack up like building blocks and push the dog over her bite threshold. So, you know, owners will sometimes go, well, we don't know what happened. He was always good with kids. Or he played with Johnny yesterday and he didn't bite him. Why did he bite him today? Um, and the two things about that is, one, that dog probably was not always good with kids. When I want, When I describe a dog as being good with kids, this is the dog who, when the kids walk in the door, her eyes light up and she goes, yay, the kids are here. I'm so happy. <laughs> Whereas a lot of dogs that are perceived as being, quote, unquote, good with kids are really just tolerating them. Okay, Maybe they have their own kids in the family and they do well with their own kids in the family. But boy, when, they, when those kids bring their friends home, the dog goes, uh-uh, and you know, goes in the other room and lies down or goes out the dog door and plays, you know, goes out in the yard on his own, but isn't excited about the other kids arriving. So often people aren't aware that their dog's really not what I would call good with kids. Their dog is tolerating kids and tolerating isn't far enough away from threshold. Okay. Mm -hmm. When you have a dog who loves kids and kids do what kids do, they trip and fall on top of the dog or, you know, they, you know, get too rough playing with the dog or try to sit on the dog or whatever things they perhaps shouldn't do, but kids do. The dog who loves kids will go, oh, I'm not crazy about this, but I love this kid, so it's okay. The dog who just tolerates kids gets pushed over threshold when those things um, are likely to happen. Okay. So we look at not just the immediate trigger. So why did Johnny bite, or why did the dog bite Johnny today when he didn't bite him yesterday? Because yesterday, Johnny came and played with the dog in the morning and all was well. And in the afternoon, um, the dog went to the vet for her annual well pet checkup, and she's stressed about going to the vet. So that was another block in the stack. She's also not crazy about riding in the car. So that was another block in the stack. Um, and then that night when she came home, her owners decided, or when, when the dog came home, it was, the owners decided it was time to trim her nails, which, you know, she doesn't scream and flail and holler, but she's tense about. So there's all these kind of additional blocks in the stack. And so today when Johnny came over to play with her and he accidentally stepped on her paw, all those things were enough to push her over the edge and she bit Johnny. Okay. Perfect. Another thing to always keep in mind is that when when a dog has a big stress event, just like our just like we do, their body um emits or or uh stress hormones. And the big bad one that we always hear about is cortisol. Okay? So a dog who's under stress has excess cortisol circulating in their system, which, um, in addition to keeping them closer to threshold, also does some other nasty stuff like weakening the immune system. Um, and so cortisol stays in the system for two to three days or longer. So something that happened two or three days ago is still a building block in that stack pushing the dog closer to threshold. And, and people, again, don't always realize that, you know, something happened two or three days ago still has their dog more on edge than she would normally be. And so also just like us, if a dog is cool, calm, and collected, everything's been going well, and something happens, they can deal with it. We're the same way, right? If we're in a good place mentally, and something bad happens, we're far better able to deal with it than we're, if we're already stressed to the max and something bad happens that pushes us over the threshold as well. So um, 
one of the things I encourage my clients to always keep in mind is, you know, think about not just today, what happened yesterday, what happened the day before. That can help explain why um, why the dog we're working with had a bad day. <laughs> they have bad days just like we do. Okay, so we really need to have information that helps people read their dogs better. I think that between you and, and I and people with our experience with dogs, we know the dogs read us much better than people generally read the dogs. Mm -hmm. So um, some of the really obvious signs like the dog having the, the hair on the back stand up or the dog crouching right. and trying to crawl Crawling away. Or, yeah. All of those things are pretty obvious, but there are many other more subtle things. And I've talked about calming signals. I don't think that many enough people really know anything about them and what to observe, but what would you suggest are the most important things for people to try and read about their dogs with what they see that suggests fear and stress? Okay, so um, I'll get there in a second. First, okay. I, I I am compelled to comment uh -huh. <laughs> that I am not fond of the term calming signals. Right. Um, because I think it's a, a misnomer. Um, it, has, it has been interpreted to mean that the dog is attempting to calm whoever's around him. Oh, right. When in right. fact, yeah, we don't yeah. know. The, we don't know. Yeah. The term, the term actually covers a, a wide variety of body language communications that have a number of different meanings. So some of them are stress sim signals. Some of them just are an indication that the dog is stressed. And so we'll, we'll take a look at those. Some of them are appeasement behaviors, right? which, and some are deference behaviors. So deference is simply in a social group um, where, where one might say, oh, you want to go out of the door first? You go first. No problem. Okay. And actually, social groups work because of deference, not dominance. Let a dog out. Where was I? <laughs> Pardon? <clears throat> Whereas um, okay, appeasement is, it, there's more fear involved. There's emotion involved in peace, appeasement. So if a dog perceives that he's going to be injured, um, he's likely to offer appeasement behaviors like lowering his body posture, putting his ears back, maybe rolling over onto his back to show his stomach. So that's a stronger emotion than um, deference behaviors. Mm -hmm. There are displacement behaviors, things a dog will do sort of out of context um, to help them cope. So I, I have long discarded the term calming signals and I prefer to identify what's going on and, and refer to them by the appropriate title. But yes, it's very valuable for people to be aware of what the different behaviors are, the, the not so obvious behaviors, to help them understand um, that that their dog may be having, you know, some increased emotions that that are uh, related to stress. So um, things like lip licking and all of all of these things can also happen in other contexts right so yes. you need to kind of look at the whole picture mm -hmm. but um lick lick li lip licking i always have trouble saying that one um eye blinking more than normal um sniffing the ground those are some signals that um people who work with dogs a lot have come to realize can indicate a degree of stress um that can also help owners um, realize when their dogs, you know, having a hard time. Yeah, I think the other thing that I, I had to let Angie out, so I may have missed that you said this, but um, one of the things that has always been a concern with the term calming signals is people's not being able to understand that whatever the behavior is, you don't know whether the dog is trying to calm you or trying to be more comfortable in a situation there, or just sending, as you're saying, different bits of information. So there's a lot of confusion that, that goes associated with that general term. And you're right. And I would say rarely, if ever, is the dog trying to calm you. Right. I that, think if, that if you're angry, yeah. if you're if you're angry at your dog or just angry in general and your dog's worried because of the emotion you're putting out and he's doing calming signals, quote unquote, of some kind, he's doing appeasement behaviors, 
he's not trying to calm you. He's trying to keep himself safe. Right. Yes. It's for a sure. self. It's a self-preservation um, series of social behaviors. So I would say, if you want to go out in the garage and punch holes in the wall, you know, he's okay with that. He's safe in the house. Right. right. So he's really not trying to calm you. He's trying to keep himself safe. But we do know that, for example, talking in terms of stress, that if I'm seriously stressed about something, and I've had this happen in the past, not with every dog I've ever owned, but I've had dogs come to me and what appears to be trying to ease the situation, you know, the chin on my knee, and yes. that they're, they're responding in an empathetic way yes. to our needs. I think that that's something that is so fabulously unique with our dogs. They do what works for them, but we do know, I think, beyond a doubt that they also respond to us, which means that when we're seriously stressed, the dog that closely relates to us is going to be responding with stress of its own. Do you agree? Exactly, yeah. yes, and, and I totally agree with that, absolutely. All right. So, so one of the ways um, I work with clients when we're we're working with a dog who has um, and 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 stress and anxiety don't always uh, result in a in a dog who's coming to me for aggression. Um, mm -hmm. We see dogs who who may have what we call generalized anxiety disorder, where you know kind of they're stressed about the whole world, <laughs> and if pushed. They may aggress, but that's usually that may not be why the client's coming to see me for that particular dog. It's just that this dog's always worried. This dog's always fearful. Um, and so one of the things that I will often do with those clients is we sit down and we make a list of as many things we can think of that cause the dog to be even a little bit worried. This doesn't have to be the... Um, you know, I'm going to take your face off, <laughs> aggression, stress. It can be just, oh, yeah, you're right, vacuum cleaner. Because one I usually add is vacuum cleaner. Oh, yeah, if I start the vacuum, not, it's not a problem. If I start the vacuum cleaner, he jumps up and runs out of the room. Um, but you know what? He already then had that moment of stress. Mm -hmm. right. And so if your dog is worried about the vacuum cleaner, you're much better off removing him from the room before you start the vacuum cleaner. Mm -hmm. Put him in the yard, put him in, an, you know, put him in another room, have, you know, another family member take him for a walk. Um, but that way you avoid adding that building block, even if it's a small one, you avoid adding that building block to the stack. So we list as many things as we can think of that we know cause stress for this dog. And then we start chipping away at them. We look at taking away as many as possible. We can never make all stress go away. You know, stress is a part of life, and there will always be some stress. But the more building blocks we can take out of that stack, um, the farther away the dog is from his bite threshold, so the less likely he is to bite somebody, and the better his quality of life will be. And that also so, translates it better that to be able to properly and and nicely handle in periods of stress because that's an important part of living that, that that you know you keep it at a level where there are things that the dog can actually handle. Yes. Yeah. So um, we make this list, and usually with most clients, we get a list between ten and twenty stressors, and then we look at. I have five strategies. <laughs> that we apply to stressors. And so we, we talk about the strategies and then I, we go through the list and we, we write down which strategy or strategies we want to um, apply to each of the stressors. And there will be some, and, and you'll hear that the strategies are, um, first strategy is change the dog's opinion of the stressor, uh -huh. which technically is known as counter conditioning. So if the dog is afraid of men, we can use counter conditioning to help our dog think men are good instead of scary. Okay, so that's a behavior modification process. The second strategy is teaching the dog a new behavior in the presence of the stressor. All right, so that's operant conditioning. 
So let's say your dog is stressed by people ringing your doorbell. We could do counter conditioning for the doorbell, and the way we do that is ring the doorbell, feed him a treat, ring the doorbell, feed him a treat, ring the doorbell, feed him a treat, until his brain goes, oh, wow, the doorbell makes chicken happen. I guess the doorbell's okay. And then you have somebody else ring the doorbell. I mean, you add layers as your dog starts to to have those um, re- realizations. So that's counter conditioning for the doorbell. You could also teach your dog that the doorbell is the cue to um, run in the other room and get in your crate. So that when the doorbell rings, instead of anxiously barking at the door, he happily runs in the room, in the other room, and gets in his crate. And now you've managed the situation as well by able, being able to calmly close the crate door so he's not greeting your guests if he's not good at greeting the guests. So you've taught him an operant behavior. And because operant and classical conditioning are working together all the time, you've also helped him get happier about the doorbell ringing because it means he gets a treat when he goes in the crate. So those are the two big modification strategies. The third strategy is management. So you can um, reduce stressors in your dog's stack by managing his world so he doesn't have to encounter that stressor, all right? So, or at least reducing how much he has to encounter the stressor. So if he is stressed by seeing people walk past the living room window, You know, several times a day, he gets frantic and runs back and forth barking because people are walking. He sees people walking past the living room window. That means he's getting big shots of cortisol every single day. So he never gets down to a normal baseline level of cortisol. Cover the windows. Cover the windows. That's management. You haven't spent any time doing counter conditioning, um, but in, in a very short, you know, 10 minutes you can cover the windows, and you've removed a stressor from his daily stack. And I have to say, I did have a client one time who told me that her homeowners association told her she could not cover her windows, which just, I just want to scream. I'm not a fan of homeowners associations, (laughs) but um, curtains, people go, well, I'll draw the curtains. A lot of dogs are really good at just, you know, sticking their nose behind the curtains and looking out the window. So that doesn't, that may cut it if that works for you, but you know, nice colored poster board, put artwork on it or something so that it's more attractive and not just a piece of cardboard across your windows. But that would be a way to manage um, that dog's significant stressor. Strategy number four is get rid of it. And when I say that with a client, I always say, I mean the stressor, not the dog. (laughs) (laughs) But um, if you can get rid of the stressor, boom, it's gone, right? So say I had a client who came to me and they'd been using a shock collar. Um, that's Shock is a huge stressor. So I would get rid of it. We're never going to use the shock collar again. Bingo. That's a block out of the stack. Okay. And I forgot to mention on management. I want to go back to, to management for a minute. Um, some, you'll hear some trainers say management always fails. Oh, no. I, I try to never say always or never. Uh-huh. Um, But yes, management has a high likelihood of failure. So if we're looking at management as a particular strategy for dealing with behavior in any capacity, we need to look at what's the likelihood of management failure. If it's an all-adult home with adults who are all committed to the management program, then likelihood of management failure is low. If there are children in the home, lots of visitors in the home, then the potential for management failure increases. Or if you have adults living in the home who either aren't committed to the program or who are deliberately looking to undermine the program, um, then management has a higher likelihood of failure. So then we look at, okay, if management fails, what's the result? So if I'm trying to manage a dog for um, counter surfing and management fails, all right, so I lost my ham sandwich. Not a big deal. If I'm trying to manage a child because he's quite aggressive um, with small children and we have a three-month-old baby in the home and management fails, then I don't want to talk about it, (laughs) okay? 
So if you're looking at long-term management, you need to keep those things in mind. So we've done counter conditioning, operant conditioning, management, get rid of the stressor, and then the fifth strategy is live with it because we can't make all stress go away. So we can look at our list of stressors, and one of the one of the stressors I will usually add, as you had mentioned before, is owner stress, right? And that might be one we have to live with because stress happens for all of us. Um, and just pointing it out helps the owner realize, oh, yeah, on these days when I'm having a really bad day, then my dog is closer to threshold. Then I might you know, that might be the day I don't invite Johnny to come over and play with the dog. That's, I think that's so, a really important point that we have to be more aware of what we're bringing into the household and what we're mm -hmm. bringing to the dogs. Again, mm -hmm. because they're so sentient, because they read us so well, yes. we have to be more cognizant of how well they are reading us that there are very few surprises that are likely to take place. Um, you can try to put on a smiley face and you're going to feel better because you have, but mm -hmm. if your cortisol level is high, in spite of that, don't be surprised if your dog reads through the smile. So mm -hmm. I, I think these are, you know, this is important. We need to recognize that that loving companionship and partnership that we have, there is a price that we have to pay to keep it going smoothly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I address it with a client. And then what we do, you know, if you've got a list of 20 stressors, we're not going to start doing counter conditioning for 10 of those. I have my client, we agree, anything that we talked about using management for, we're going to put management in place. Anything we agreed to get rid of, we're going to get rid of. And then we're going to pick two to four of our top stressors that we're going to start doing a modification program for. So if we have a fearful dog, we might have identified six different things that, that he's particularly, she's particularly fearful of. We're gonna start with maybe one or two or maybe three of those things and figure out how to implement a counter conditioning program for those things. We're not gonna to try to do all of them at once. So we'll start with the most important ones. Usually that's the first thing the client came to see me about. You know, that my dog's fearful of men and I have a new boyfriend and, you know, I need to get him to like the boyfriend. Okay, so that's going to be our number one priority because that's why the client made the appointment to come see me. But the more other things we can start adding into the program over time, the further away from his threshold um, that dog will stay. I think that's an and again, important we're talking point. about yeah, yeah, that's, we're we're talking about stress. So it's not all necessarily about aggression, but in general, the less stressed you can make your dog's life, the better her quality of life will be. Yeah, and I'll bet you that you know if the major stressor, such as you mentioned, is men, and the dog has a few other things that, for all we know, the dog may have associated with men at some experience in the past. Uh, possibly the dog doesn't like umbrellas, but maybe it's because he, the first time he saw a man, he didn't like he had, the man had an umbrella. But mm -hmm. I think that, that the chances are probably pretty good that if we drastically reduce the level of stress for that primary issue, that we may see a reduction in other areas where the dog is le less at a high level of cortisol flowing through the body than it was before. And it gets a little easier with some of these less stressful things, I'll mm -hmm. bet you. It certainly can, it certainly can. Important that people understand that when we're doing behavior modification, it's not linear. Right, um, mm -hmm. I which think that's, means... that's what I was trying to say and I didn't say it very well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. But also that you'll think you're making progress and then you know, you'll have a day where, oh, I thought he was doing better. Why is he barking again? Or why is he growling again? Um, because there's other stressors happening, but because also, um, just like us, you know, they've got some good days and some not so good days. So, so things can get better. And then you want to not despair <laughs> if you have a day where it seems like you haven't gotten anywhere at all.
because I'd like ask. to I'd like to take a chance here to let Nate come in. I see he's writing and he's listening <laughs> oh. and he's and he's nodding his head and I I'll bet you he's going to have something to say or ask. Okay. Okay, go for it. Well, uh, thank you again for all this information, Pat. Yes, I have been writing down. I got a page full of notes. Uh, one of the <laughs> things that I I I wanted to uh, remind listeners about, which I was not really surprised about, but it's, you know, I should have realized that before, is that the trigger stacking. Dogs can have bad days just like us. Like when I wake up and I, the first thing I do is stub my toe on something and then I spill the milk and then I'm late for work and things stack up for us and it ends up yeah. affecting our moods, not only for that day, but it could be for the, the next day and the next day. And so dogs, yeah. dogs can have their stress triggers stack up and it can affect them for days. That is something good to know, especially as a dog owner. Now, on that note, we often, as you guys have mentioned, dogs read us better than we read them. So we can't read our dogs all that well. And so it is often going to be the case that we do not know what is stressing our dog out. So I have a couple of questions for you. How can we pinpoint the cause of a stressor and how can we help reduce the stress in our dog? Okay, so um, what I tell clients is, because people tend to think, oh, I'm looking for, the thing that a stressor for my dog is the thing that makes him get reactive, makes him bark and lunge or makes him, you know, run away. Um, I tell clients, look for anything that causes your dog to be even slightly worried, all right? And that's, I mean, along with lip licking and sniffing and blinking, um, if you start watching your dog's face, you can see the difference between a relaxed, happy face, an alert face, and a worried face. So start looking for things that, that cause your dog to, to have that worried face, right? Because those are the, actually in some ways, the easier stressors. <laughs> so they're the ones that are easier to make go away. They're not as, they don't cause as strong an emotional response as, um, as the bigger stressors. So... So looking at those and, and helping those go away um, can can lighten the overall stressor burden for your dog, okay? And then the way to, to relieve those is the things we were just talking about, um, you know, either manage your dog's world so that he doesn't have to be around those things, um, do uh, make the things go away entirely, if you've got something in your house that makes a noise that bothers your dog and it's not something that you have to have in your house, remove it from your house. Um, if, um, and then for the other things, we're back to changing your dog's opinion or teaching him new behaviors in the, in the presence of those stressors. If you teach your dog something, a behavior that he loves to do, for example, one of the things we teach in our classes is targeting, where we teach your dog to touch his nose to your hand. And a lot of dogs get really, really happy about that. If you see him start to get worried, or a trick maybe that you taught him that you know he loves to do, you see him starting to get worried, you can ask him to do a behavior that you know makes him really happy, and you can bring his brain back to the happy side, because he got to do something that he really likes to do. One that I use for this also is find it, which is the easiest thing you will ever teach your dog. You drop a treat between your feet and you say, find it, and you show him where it is. Every dog gets this right like the first time. Um, and again, this is one that they get really happy about. They get a positive association with the find it cue, because they go, oh, find it. Oh, there's treats on the ground. And so when you see him starting to get worried about something, you can go find it, and his brain goes, oh, yay, I'm looking for treats on the ground, and it can put his brain back in a happy place if he's starting to drift to worry. Now, that doesn't work if he's, like, way over threshold because um, when you're over threshold and you think you're going to die, the last thing you want to think about is stopping for a snack. But if you, if you see the body language that says, you know, his body's starting to get tense, he's starting to stare at something, he's looking worried, 
um, and you can do something that brings him his brain back to happy, you can kind of bounce him out of it. Right. It's I, one of the things that I very, very frequently tell people when it comes to giving treats is if your dog won't take a treat when it's something you're trying to desensitize, mm -hmm. increase the distance. You know, yes. And then gradually yes. I can get closer when your dog is comfortable, but, but, but read your dog, let your dog let you yes. know. And, of course, and even not just take treats, but if your dog normally takes treats gently, Oh, yeah. And is now shredding the skin on your fingers. Yes, that's dark. another sign of yeah. tension. Absolutely. So I that's find, that's another that. one that says, yeah. "Oh, move farther away." Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I my dog uh, will get sharky. I call it being sharky mm -hmm. when when she's uh, concerned about something. I uh, hasn't yep. actually shredded my fingers, but it's like, oh, that did not feel wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Did not feel wonderful. Yeah. So this this yep, is yep. yeah. That it's and the other thing, of course, is if you've been sliding along with um, some maybe not so valuable wonderful treat, uh, sometimes it's it's really I suggest having a trail mix so that you may have some treats that are okay and others that they'll dance through hoops of fire to get and you can <laughs> surprise them by coming up with something very special. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is uh, jackpots. And I love the idea that if your dog has just done something that you have been hoping was going to happen and it finally did, mm -hmm. is the importance of the jackpot is have it in your hand, but not, they don't get to gobble all of them in one bite. You, you right. roll them out, you know, here you are, jackpot, jackpot, jackpot. So Right, but, because there's more benefit in getting many treats than there is in getting one big chunk. That's right. And, you know, and that's, very... that's interesting because I, there was a study I saw not so long ago where dogs were tested on quantity. So they would have mm -hmm. the same number of treats on a plate that they reached you know, side to side, as well as a treat, a table, I mean, a, a, a plate that they filled the same amount but it was only like in the middle and the dogs mm -hmm. could figure it out. They, they, yeah. they, they knew the, the number of treats were there, not the size of the plate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yep. Interesting stuff going on with um, studies of canine cognition. And just the, the whole point that, um, you know, we used to get laughed at if we suggested that animals had emotions. Oh, yes. You know, you were accused of being anthropomorphic and, you know, now we know that they have very much the same range of emotions we do and that um, that, along with everything else, that obligates us to be nicer to them, that obligates us to treat them better. Yes, and if this is something that I attempt to stress with great regularity is the science behind mm -hmm. the current way to address the animals as compared yep. to I've done it, I've had dogs for 20 years and I've done it and it always worked. And what We've I say, always yeah. done it that way. And it's true when, when I, before I crossed over, there was never any discussion in training class about why we did things the way we did. Right. Or why it worked or didn't work. It's just, this is how we do it. Right. And I, what I generally say about that is, okay, there's 20 years of experience and there's one year of experience 20 times. <laughs> yes. Uh, yep. <laughs> And that's what Absolutely. a lot of it was. That's what it was, that, yeah. that this is the way we've always done it and it works. And of course, what is meant by it works mm -hmm. all too often is the translation is the dog no longer jumps on people because we yanked on him and, um, and pushed them and need them and so on. But what about where the dog is now in relationship to me because I did that to the dog? or mm -hmm. his or her reaction in general to other people, what discomforts have I inflicted on that dog at the price of obedience, quote unquote. Right. And it's interesting that in today's world, we don't talk in terms of obedience classes. You know, well, I you stopped, and I don't. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I <stopped laughs> there are still unfortunately ago. far too many trainers who do, but you and I don't, and there are plenty of trainers who don't. Right, more so um, than ever you know, before, yes. Yeah. Yes. But it's still, it's still out there. And part of the reason it's still out there is, as you suggested, it works to suppress behaviors. It works. Right. It appears to work. It works well enough in the moment that it feels like you're accomplishing what you want to accomplish. And I know Nate, would, 
I know Nate would step in here and say that uh, Charlotte says it doesn't teach them what to do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sounds like you're quoting me. <laughs> I wonder where I learned that. I wonder where I learned that. <laughs> um, but absolutely, and that's why that's why it persists. That's why you still see trainers who use what I call old-fashioned methods um, because it works well enough. And, you know, look back to when we did it. I loved my dogs. Right. They were well-trained, quote-unquote. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I totally understand, you know, how people can get drawn into continuing to use methods that appear to work. Right. It's just that some of us have, have changed um, our goals or our expectations or, or our um, aspirations for how we interact with our dogs and what our relationships are with our dogs. Right, and I've I've mentioned that you know I was I was successful. Um, Paco, my giant schnauzer, was fourth in in the country in Mexico in um, the open class, um, mm -hmm. a pretty big title to have, and mm -hmm. and he was a tough tough minded dog. I can remember I'd mm -hmm. pet him and he'd throw my hand off. You know, let's get on with things. <laughs> And then Moxie, my Bouvier, came along, and the same methods were not suited to him. He was a soft dog, mm -hmm. and I used a forced retrieve with him, and he would just stand there and chatter and shake. Mm -hmm. And I then that was at that point that I discovered positive reinforcement training, and I decided that I would not show him in the open class where he would have to retrieve a dumbbell. He'd retrieve anything else happily mm. bounce along bring it back i could i could get him to go out into the pond at the golf course and bring them the empty coke bottles back and so on but the dumbbell he would just shake and i made up my mind that i would not show him an open if i could not get him to rever to begin to retrieve the dumbbell mm -hmm. happily and i couldn't do it i, I couldn't good get for him. you i mean good not good that you couldn't but good, good for you for making that choice yeah yeah i i, I could not reverse it could yeah. not yeah. And it was, and, and Zagal came along and he was the first of the dogs that had, you know, the last dog that I've had was my own dog to have positive reinforcement. And I can remember in a dog training class when I had branched off and was doing positive reinforcement and to, the difference when we were doing heel and everybody's marching along and the dogs are marching mm -hmm. along. And we went to let's go and tails were wagging and people were smiling and we were getting it yep. done. Yep. It's huge. Incredible. Difference. Yep. I say all the time, you could not pay me enough to go back to doing it the old way. Oh, no, no, not a chance. And, yeah. and in this area, there is still a trainer that does the old fashioned way. Uh, and it's interesting. I've not received any phone calls. Now, this particular program that you and I are taping with Nate it is uh, it, it airs at a different time. It's not live. But when I have a live program, um, I have not received any phone calls from somebody saying, well, I, I've been using this other method and my dog is wonderful. I've not had that. I've not had that happen, mm. which I find kind of interesting that mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not surfacing. So I think that there's I think there's an influence, even if I'm not totally aware of any changes that are taking place. But it's it, it's it's sad on so many levels to see it and have people believing it when we've come as far as we have and as right. you know, I'm, you know we're, as uh, Nate knows that I've, I've, ex I've explained what crossover trainers are and that is we started off with the only methods that were being taught back then yep. and and now I really like to um, pick, make a big issue of the science behind it not mm -hmm. just this is the way, this is the new way, and uh, this is why right. we do it. I really like to impress upon people the science because as you mentioned a bit ago, it's not been very long, maybe what, 20 years maximum that there's been any attention at all paid to how cognizant and sentient dogs are. Probably 15 years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's been a very short period of time. I, and I, yes. I've kidded in the past about people knew more about fruit flies than they knew about canines. And, <laughs> and it's it's true that the, you didn't study dogs. I mean, dogs were around all the time. Why would you study dogs? Well, my, right. oh my, what we've learned since then. It's, um, it's pretty amazing. Okay, Nate, did you have something else on that list? And uh, well, I just want to say uh, that 
those old ways, in my words, those old, old ways work fine, but fine is not thriving with your dog. Uh, there, there you go. And uh, yes, yep. you, there's you can a, put fine in my quotation. My quotation no, that's right. I forgot there. about yeah. that. <laughs> yes. And uh, yes, there's lots to learn. And we just learned a whole bunch from Pat Miller in this hour. Uh, again, Pat Miller, thank you for being with us today. Uh, we hope to you have you back. You are most because- welcome. This is quite a topic. Again, dogs are sentient beings. They get upset just like we do. It's up to us to help them not feel that stress. And one of the ways that, uh, to keep it simple, uh, Pat Miller said to watch their face. Watch yeah. their face. Yeah. And if you, you can tell if they're starting to feel different. And one of the things you could do is have some fun with your dog. Do Do something that mm-hmm. your dog likes to do. Get their mind off of that. Just like we do when we're stressed out. You know, I go for a walk or something like that. Okay. So, Pat, before we... uh... If I have time, I want to say one more quick thing. Please. This was on Facebook last year, and I love it, and I use it all the time now, to remind people your dog is not giving you a hard time. He's having a hard time. Oh, that's very good. Yeah. That's that's very good. Yes. All right. Those are good words to end on, but before we let you go, can you tell us how our listeners can find you, your services, and your books? Sure. Um, my website is www.peaceablepaws.com. That's P-E-A-C-E-A-B-L-E-P-A-W-S.com. Um, my books are available on my website. And, you know, uh, my publisher of most of my books is Dogwise at dogwise.com. And they have a fantastic um, line up of all kinds of books, so you can also get them there. If you order them from my website, I will sign them for you. Ooh, nice. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you once again, Pat Miller, for being here. And uh, Charlotte, thank you for all of the information as usual and for hanging out with us for an hour. And before we go, Charlotte, do you have any last words for us? Yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. This is from June. Carter and Cash. Every dog has his day unless he loses his tail and then he has a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> All <Cute>. right. <laughs> Thank you both for having me. Oh, our pleasure to be sure. Thanks again. Always Pat. enjoy talking with you. Thanks. You get the same here. Have a great day. Thanks, you Pat. too. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. I would like you to be able to contact me with any questions you may have regarding particularly behavior issues, but I can address other things as well. One of my favorites is nutrition. So we're here to help you, and Nate will tell you how to get your questions to us. To get your questions to us, just email livingwithyourdog at gmail.com. That's livingwithyourdog at gmail.com. And also you can find Living With Your Dog on Facebook. Living with your dog, living with your dog, living with your dog with Charlotte.